We are going to finish out the year strong because we've got some predictions for you all. These are our 2022 predictions. I've got with me today someone who is an oracle of sorts. <laughs> we could call him that. <laughs> Rhea, welcome, man. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure being here. Yes, I'm excited to chat with you. For those of you that do not know Rhea, he's the head of product at Arise AI. And we're doing this video today, video slash podcast slash video cast, whatever you want to call it. We are doing this today in conjunction with Arise because they have a few predictions, bold predictions that they want to get out, get off their chest. Uh, but Rhea, before you were at Arise, you were working at Google, so they went and they, they scooped you up from Google. You said, I want to go join a startup, I imagine, and do some cool stuff around, <laughs> uh, around what these different uh, startups are doing around ML observability. And so your experience as a team and product leader is extensive, to say the least. You've touched on a broad cross-section of AI technology of the AI technology landscape, I should say. And you played a pivotal role in ML and AI initiatives at Google, at IBM Watson, which uh, I've got a lot of questions for you, but not for today. Later, maybe when we stop recording offline, we can talk about IBM Watson and what happened there. You also were working at Intuit. So you have quite the track record, man. And that is what gives me the faith in your predictions. <laughs> I like to, I really would like to hear what you've got to say. But before we get into the real predictions, I thought, I know we talked about this. I thought it would be really funny to talk about some of the wrong predictions that I put up and the different members of the community have been answering back with. I threw up on LinkedIn and Twitter on the MLOps community Twitter. What the 2022 predictions you have are, and I asked for wrong answers only. And so we highlighted a few that we wanted to talk about. And I'll say the funniest one that I found so far is the MLOps integrated into Excel sheets. So someone called it Excel Ops. <laughs> that yeah, is 2022 I, in a nutshell. That's definitely happening. That's definitely happening. <laughs> um, alternatively, I, I feel like, you know, we could just as an entire community realize that ML was a waste of time and return to rule-based systems. So that could happen <laughs> as well. That was another great one from Skylar Payne. And that first one that I gave was from Munida and... It's quite a long last name, so I'm going to butcher it. I'm just going to say that right now. And Munina Kamitova. Thank you all for chiming in on that. If anyone else has some bad MLOps predictions for 2022, jump on to LinkedIn and write them in there or Twitter, or just throw them in the comments here because we love hearing bad predictions. Those are the most fun. But now let's get into it. Rhea, what are the real predictions that we should be thinking about for 2022? Sure. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. I have a couple slides to kind of get me going. But um, thanks for having me again. And, uh, you know, I think I think we'll just kick it off with the first prediction that nice. AI fairness and bias issues will get worse before they get better. And the truth is, it's like when AI makes headlines, it generally falls on kind of one of two extremes. It's either a major advancement, such as AlphaGo beating the reigning world champion, or unfortunately, many times it's kind of the polar opposite. It's, it's generally a very disturbing issue um, that has to do with fairness or algorithmic bias. And some of the most kind of infamous examples uh, are issues having to do with facial recognition software and image classification or search ranking results for various keywords. Or I'm sure you've seen the terrible natural language bots on Twitter and kind of the list goes on. And, and what we've really seen is that wherever ML models are kind of contributing and creating, models are also 
affecting how society and especially underprivileged and underrepresented groups are treated through this perpetuation of algorithmic bias. Um, and it's, it's not like new news to people. Um, I think we all know that ML models are built by humans and they're trained on historical data, which is in large part, oftentimes hom homogeneous, kind of leaving these huge blind spots. Um, but I will say there's hope, okay, Dimitrios, there's, there's hope. We, we've got um, That's what significant, I like ad significant advancements in establishing these kind of cross-company ethical AI committee, committees. And um, when I was at Google uh, Research and, and Machine Intelligence Group, um, I helped spearhead kind of the responsible AI principles that we're putting into works. And so, you know, I, the only thing I can say is that kind of, I, I hope fairness is not adopted by companies as a forcing function, but rather that companies kind of perceive the change for a more inclusive, diverse, and better system of uh, ML govern, governance to kind of help represent sensitive attributes and privileged and marginalized groups and every intersectionality in between. So that's kind of the first prediction I have. Yeah, and that's funny that you mentioned that too. I mean, I've talked about this quite a few times about the ethics washing and how hopefully it's not that you're trying to pick up this fairness uh, because you are trying to ethics wash your, your company or you're trying to put on the facade that you're doing things correctly. Uh, so hopefully it is yeah. that you're picking it up for the right reasons and you really care about this stuff. But... The prediction here is that it's going to get worse before it gets better. Hmm. Yeah, um, I, ha I have to agree with you there on the on the ethics washing. I think um, it's all too common, um, and I mean it, it, it's a noble and it's kind of this copious effort that companies really have to take on, kind of with you know jumping in head first and say something is wrong, even if there are not governance or regulations in place yet, I should help lead the, the, the industry, the space, um, and do what's right. So that'll be my first kind of prediction. Moving on to number two, kind of enterprises will stop shipping AI blind. And th this one's kind of broadly uh, a jab at some of the, the corporate track record that you shouted out to me. Um, no matter the company size, no matter the, the, the revenue and the big numbers and whether you're on NASDAQ or not, kind of everybody is, is lacking true, deep understanding of their model across the entire ML life cycle. So, you know, what are your ML models kind of performance and behavior stresses in real world chaotic environments? And it's, it, it doesn't matter whether it's um, a global pandemic or a viral TikTok trend that kind of changes the state of uh, the environment where your model was trained to perform well in, but you need to be prepared to really understand kind of what's gonna harm your core business metrics. Uh, how will your model behave when it kind of is put under these different stressors and, you know, what, again, whether it's a human behavior or world climate that's changing, pushing models into production without applying ML observability practices and principles will have a very expensive toll on your, on your core business metrics, on the experience of your users when they're interacting with your product. Um, and organizations are starting to realize that. I mean, it's, it's taking more than just monitors firing off when something goes wrong. It's true ML observability that allows you to kind of proactively monitor, understand when things aren't looking pretty, but then furthermore, facilitating kind of a root cause analysis and actually troubleshooting the issues, reducing the time to value. Don't just tell me how my model's kind of global performance is, but show me what kind of feature value combinations I'm missing and failing to classify correctly. You know, help me improve, retrain, deploy, reduce that ML model life cycle circle. Um, and yeah, it will come, ML observability will come to the forefront at companies big and small to, to 
troubleshoot these complex ML systems. Nice. I mean, also, of course, you you hope that happens, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I am That's biased. A, you are <laughs> a little this bit biased for that. <laughs> this algorithm is still not operating fairly. No, I, I, I genuinely mean what I say. It's part of why I left uh, Google to kind of found this. I mean, when I was at these massive companies working in these phenomenal AI groups, you know, the, the controlled research environment was one thing, but actually pushing that model over the line into a real world production environment was almost kind of like, all right, I hope this goes well. <laughs> so hmm. uh, it's based off some real experience. Nice. What else you got for us? I think the citizen data scientist will make a phenomenal kind of rise uh, uh, and, and it really come to the forefront. I think like, there's a lot of low code or no code tools that allow you to, to really exercise deep subject matter expertise um, without necessarily kind of the engineering and infra chops that most people need nowadays to train and deploy ML models, um, you know, in their respective industries. And, you know, maybe it's a, a risk manager developing a model that prevents viral outbreaks or a structural engineer that's building a model to, to predict metal erosion on, on the bridge or building that they're working on. But you know, a, a lot of times ML infra tools cater to ML engineers and they become more sophisticated and specialized. And I think that um, as ML models kind of become accepted as part of everyday life, uh, the need for more ML engineers to make models work in the real world will kind of reach this frenzy point. And at that point, you know, we're, we're going to need to marshal resources and it's across academia, the private sector, government, you name it. Um, and, I, and I actually think this, that this is already, this is preceded a bit 2022, if I'm being honest here. I think we've seen even in recent years, big companies, They've removed the hiring requirement for needing to have a college degree. Um, mm -hmm. There's been a insane trajectory of of coding and data science boot camps that are taking people from hospitality and, and, and across tons of different industries and kind of reshaping um, the citizen data scientists. You know, you have all these self-paced, free learning and online courses and respective certifications and. I think we're really going to start seeing kind of a new revolution of what I've coined to be citizen data scientists rise and, and start to get their hands dirty um, with, uh, with ML. So I've got a few questions on this one because these two examples that you talk about, they, they are fascinating. It reminds me a lot of a conversation that I had almost at the beginning of this year with Luigi Petruno from ML in production, the, uh, newsletter and website. And he said the same thing. He said, you're going to start seeing more subject matter experts being able to get their hands dirty with machine learning. But when I look at these like two examples that you talk about here, it feels to me like these are examples of people that get to use machine learning almost, it's not a research setting, but it's, it's not like it's an API that's getting hit a thousand times a minute and you're not getting like a model, like for example, the structural engineer that can predict metal erosion on bridges. And do you see that? I mean, I guess as hard as, as hard as it is to predict the future, <laughs> do you see this as being something where it's like, okay, this model is like this. And then you have many structural engineers that can hit, an API and and get this model that predicts the rust on the bridges or or whatnot, or is it something that's just like all right, I've got this bridge and I want to use machine learning to augment my ability to understand what the possibilities of this bridge could be in the future, and so I've got a a tool or a ML as a service that makes that a lot easier for me. I think that's a phenomenal question. Um, I would love to see the former, but I think the 
the kind of in the interim, at least in 2022, my prediction is that we will see the latter. We will see um, kind of versatile services being put out there for everyday citizens to almost become these data scientists and be able to look at um, whether it's uh, a graph or a kind of performance chart and understand the probability or the likelihood that metal erosion will happen given X through or A through Z predict, uh, features of their building. Yeah. And it could be as simple as kind of uploading that blueprint into the service, you know, taking a picture, scanning it in and selecting the features that you, you, you truly care about. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, being able to interpret the output of, of the model. So I think it's right now the, the latter, but I would love to see the structural engineer actually select the model type, the algorithm, the underlying technique. Um, and, and I hope that comes as, as early as 2022. <laughs> we will see. Yeah, this is a fascinating one for me just because of all the use cases it will open up and the new types of, as you're saying, citizen data scientists that will get to play in this realm. It also is a little bit like, okay, well, I guess then ML ops as we know it and talk about it now is going to be a little bit different, I guess, or, or there's, there's always going to be a need for the engineering side. And then there's going to be the need for this low code and with the GUI and, and that kind of stuff. So it'll be really cool to see how this plays out over the next year. And I'm going to hold you to it next year at this time. We're yeah. going to get you back on here and see. We're going to talk about how we did and what we think for next year or the following well, year. Well, uh, I'll send you a calendar invite for you know this time next yeah. year. <laughs> what do we got next? All right. So the ML infrastructure ecosystem will become incredibly more complex. And oh, man. So Not you, more you than it is already. <laughs> So you mentioned during my um, enterprises will stop shipping AI blind that like, oh, you want this to happen. You know, theoretically, maybe I don't want this prediction to happen. So, you know, I'm, I'm a little unbiased. I'm a bit more fair, you know, I, I'm showing you both yeah. sides of the coin. Um, I like it. You know, and, and I think compared to kind of DevOps or data engineering, ML, ML ops tools cater to ML engineers. And, and, you know, this is kind of fascinating because this, term ML engineer is still relatively young and, and the industry is still in its early days on, you know, the Gartner hype cycle. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, companies have billions of dollars at stake, are have an increasing need for these incredible metrics and tools that are distinct from software, right? And so in the past decade, you actually saw the software development tool chain go through its ups and downs and kind of drawing clear winners across the stack. So, you know, GitHub for version control and Datadog for app observability. And the ML tool chain is kind of following that, you know, we're, we're making strides from early adopters to early majority, but we're still in that early adoption life cycle as a whole. And I think it'll get incredibly more complex, which is a great thing, actually, you know what? Um, VC, what, what it means is that VCs are investing in these companies, whether it's startups or enterprises kind of building their own internal teams. We're, we're getting validation for the need of ML infra. And, you know, everyone's trying to get in on this lucrative, valuable topic or subject matter. And, and um, you know, I think generally what we see is like this drastic plummet after the the peak of inflated expectations and you know i'll, I'll kind of throw something in there that i personally am wondering if slash when this will happen with nfts but you know maybe that's a different oh, conversation interesting um but i think you can expect the same of the ml infra ecosystem there's no doubt about the value and the roi that people are realizing in these early days and i think that will only increase as we kind of plateau to productivity and the tools continue to mature. Um, but, you know, it will become inflated. There will be some consolidation. Uh, we kind of see this happen across all industries. And 
all environments. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing who the clear winners are. Ooh, yeah, I, I'm going to just go out on a limb and say that in 2022, we're not going to see yet who the winners are. I think it's probably going to be maybe 2025 that we see actual like solid consolidation. I think right now we're still, as you mentioned, there's new tools coming out every other week and they all come into the MLOps community and try and post in general and talk about how cool their tool is. But there are, I mean, on one hand, I think there is space for them or there are these use cases because a lot of tools I hear about, the reason that they've started is because there was this problem at the last company that the founders decided to spin out the tool that they built internally and make it available for the public. So there are the use cases and there are, is that interest there. And then there is the money, like VCs try and talk to me all the time about <laughs> what's new in ML ops, what's hot, what are some companies you've heard of, what are you th thinking about? And so the money is pouring into this field. And that's why I'm going to agree with you that it's just going to get more and more bloated uh, in 2022. I don't know about consolidation. We saw a little bit of consolidation this year with Converge and Algorithmia. And I think Determined got bought too. So that was interesting because those players, I feel like those are the, the OGs in the MLOps world. And they've been around for longer than five years or three years. And, and then they got, they got bought or acquired. And so we'll see what happens next. Like, who's the next wave of acquires? Uh, so it's a fascinating one to keep an eye on. I like that you brought this up. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, for the software tool chain, I, I feel like it, it took about a decade to, to figure out who the clear yeah. winners are. So... Um, yeah, I think we're, we're still at uh, early days of in, inflated expectations, um, <laughs> but the ROI and, and, and the value is uh, being validated by this mm -hmm. level of, of investment and kind of new companies coming into the space every day, as you mentioned. Mm. What else we got? Um, so I, I think, oh. you know, in many ways, uh, and, you know, you have all these crazy stats. I think I've heard as, as much as 90% of the world's data is unstructured. When I was at IBM, they, they always quoted that um, unstructured data makes up about 80% of all enterprise data. And so for those who are more on the ops side than, than the actual data side, uh, unstructured data, you know, we're referring to really text, mobile activity, social media posts, the censored data from Internet of Things, anything audio video, text, or image. Um, and in recent years, I, I feel like it's becoming increasingly ubiquitous in that people are leveraging unstructured data or starting to leverage it. Um, you know, we've seen like a ton of data mining use cases across enterprise, enabling businesses to really identify consumer behaviors and product sentiment and purchasing patterns. But like, Maybe some of the most common ones are chatbots, which people love and hate. Um, performing text analysis to kind of route customer questions to, to answer sources. Mm. Um, but as machine learning becomes kind of more accessible to a wider audience, um, I think different types of data and perhaps you know the most uh, difficult to deal with, both expensive and um, hard to interpret, hard to represent data is unstructured. And so yeah. as we, you know, ramp up in 2022, I think there have been several new research and groundbreaking uh, techniques around how we represent and leverage unstructured data. Um, embedding is perhaps one of the most popular. Uh, embeddings are dense vector representations of images, text, video, et cetera. And I think the things we're going to see uh, unstructured data help with is kind of real deep understanding of customer needs, creating better product opportunities, reduce, reducing operational costs. And, and all of this is, again, if you, if you kind of think about how much text, how much 
video and content that people, influencers, uh, my mom, everybody is just kind everybody of putting out there everybody. on their social media, you know, it's, us right it's now. ridiculous. Yes, us right now. So um, I really hope to see the, the power of unstructured data kind of be unleashed into the world. Mm. And actually, this reminds me of a conversation that I had with uh, Cody Coleman when I was back in San Francisco and we had the MLOps community happy hour. And he was talking about how with unstructured data, it's typically been very difficult to deal with. But now when you're seeing the rise of uh, the data centric ML, he's making a bet that it's going to be much more of a thing. And he's also saying we're going to be able to unleash this power because you're going to have to label less. You're going to need to uh, not have so much data to be able to replicate and get these same results. So I hope that happens. I mean, that is a uh, quite a lofty goal. We'll see what goes on. But I will say that I've heard more and more. I've been hearing lots of use cases and examples of people talking about how they're working on computer vision models. And so that's super cool to see. Yeah. Um, and kind of we'll wrap up right here with the last prediction. And this one has to do with robustness and stability of ML model against changes. So I think um, ML, for, for first off, ML model robustness is kind of defined as a model's resistance to performance regressions under various conditions. In other words, it's the stability of the output of your model against or in the face of kind of both organic and adversarial perturbations. So it can be a, a simple example is and maybe a, you mentioned computer vision models like the, the Tesla autopilot sensors or cameras. Um, they perhaps perform awesome in sunny, bright LA, West Coast type days. But what about in a more suburban environment in the rain or snow, right? So, so what's that model's resistance to uh, changes in their environment? Can it still identify a cyclist correctly? And there have been advancements in kind of learning paradigms across the board from supervised to semi to unsupervised learning that have created tremendous opportunities um, for scaling these tedious and error prone human processes. But they simultaneously create opportunities for manipulation and gamification. So we see this, I mean, no matter what industry you're in, uh, you're susceptible to kind of spam, fraud, and abuse around the clock. Like fraudsters are relentless in their efforts to identify your, your model's exploitations and take advantage of businesses. And I mean, this is, this is their full-time job. Um, you know, so what I, I believe is that ML observability will become uh, a way to help surface these vulnerabilities much, much faster. And when you not just surface the vulnerabilities or exploitations that are going on with your model, but you also provide actionable recommendations for improving your model, you, be, you in nature have a more robust ML model, a more stable model. And that's both to organic perturbations or adversarial. And I think the emphasis here um, in the image you're seeing on the screen is kind of an example of an adversarial perturbation where someone kind of manipulates an image through pixelation or dithering or other creative means to kind of confuse an image classification model so that what you're seeing here is not is classified as nonviolent or suitable for work. Um, and kind of neural networks are, are who I'm taking a jab at because they've led to huge advancements in the state of the art, but they've also exposed a plethora of vulnerabilities, of vulnerabilities, excuse me. So, and so, ML model so that robustness. people know, 
the ones that, what we are looking at here is a picture of uh i think it's an m16 or some automatic gun and ammo around it but it's been pixelated it's been blurred out in a way that you can only see the uh, a certain part of the gun clearly and and this image is actually a, a real image that went through a classifier and was identified as a camera so just so oh. people know so, okay great uh, these are one thing that yeah you yeah one thing that you don't mention and it goes hand in hand with this robustness is what i have talked to quite a few people about when it comes to the new regulation that's being put out in the eu and how they've talked about well it, it's been proposed and i don't think it's going to go out in 2022 so i don't fault you for not talking about it i think i'll give you a pass on this one but it is interesting when you talk about robustness because one of their key criteria with machine learning and especially high risk, what they deem high risk is you have to have robust data sets. You have to have a robust machine learning model. And uh, there's a lot of things that are open for interpretation when it comes to robust. But one thing, if you take that a step further and you start thinking about, okay, well, what is robust? And, and then you start asking ethical questions around it because does robust just mean that I have all of the data that is possible? Does robust mean that the data was labeled by people in the correct way? And so one person that I was just talking to last week, they were mentioning how robustness, you also have to think about different data labeling services and that your data, if you send it off to a data labeling service, it is being labeled in an ethical way. It's not just some sweat lodge for data labeling. And so there's all kinds of things that are happening. And if it's not your, if it's not in your wheelhouse, you may not be aware of it, but uh, these different services are popping up and we gotta keep an eye on them. So not specifically MLOps related, I understand, but I, I thought I would just have to rant a little bit because it is something that I feel passionate about. No, absolutely. And I, I appreciate you giving me a pass on this one because uh, you're right. It's actually a, a, an important uh, but relatable or related tangent. Um, you know, and I, I think uh, while I'm less versed in the laws and governance happening in the EU, I think that is a very important, um, a very important uh, rule that hopefully will be instated because uh, Selfishly, um, I'd be very interested to see how they define robustness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it, that's the that's why I said kind of AI fairness will get worse before it gets better. I just think mm -hmm. regulations around these topics are so hard to define. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it it's really it's going to take time, but uh, yeah, I I really think that kind of ML model robustness will rise in 2022, and um, with that, I'm. Uh, kind of told by uh, by my peers, friends, colleagues that um, you know they they have hope in this as well. So mm. with that, I'll 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 wrap up. I have kind of one shameless plug slide. Um, just a quick call okay. out to the community that uh, we are giving kind of free access to uh, our bottoms up launch to uh, a Verize for for a year. Um, in exchange for a bit of feedback. So um, hopefully you reach out and hopefully you actually start uh, taking ML observability uh, as a first class citizen for your ML models. And uh, yeah, just thanks everyone for listening. Thanks everyone for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll kind of stop sharing now. That's uh, awesome. So for those listening, it said on the slide that they're giving away 20 220 people a free arise uh tool for a year which is awesome i like seeing that i like you all offering stuff to the community members and so i hope everyone takes you up on that i guess it's the first 20 that that hit you up and ask for the free tool uh i have one prediction i guess that you didn't mention but now that we we're talking about that last slide i feel like it I would be remiss to not say that, yeah, more talk about 
laws and regulation will happen, but nothing will actually get done. So everybody will scream from the rooftops that we need laws and regulation and we need more of this, um, of this governance on machine learning and, and on the way that machine learning is done and just they'll call it AI, uh, although MLOps falls into all of this, of course, and so lots of talk, not a lot of doing, though. That's my prediction. I think that's how we can end this. <laughs> Rhea, man, it was awesome talking to you. I appreciate all these predictions. We will see you in a year to Absolutely. go over how we did. And we'll also be giving our 2023 predictions then. All right. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. All right. See you later. And everyone that's still listening, feel free to give us a like, give us a follow, leave us a review, turn on the bell notifications, whatever it is, so you can stay up to date on the MLOps community content that gets put out. Also, we've got a Slack channel. If you're not in there, what are you doing? Get in it. You can find the link to that below in the description. We will see you all later.